You're listening to Boobies and Newbies. Find and follow Boobies and Newbies at Boobies Podcast across platforms and on boobiesandnewbies.com. And don't forget at Real Kelly Ray on TikTok because TikTok thinks I'm making porn if I use boobies in the handle. Thanks, TikTok. podcast that asks novice romance readers to think outside the dick in a box and brave the unbridled world of erotica. I'm your host Kelly Reynolds and today we are back with another steamy spotlight author interview and she's got one heck of a delicious read. But before we get into that, a few quick reminders. You can always catch up on past episodes of the podcast on our website boobiesandnewbies.com or on your favorite podcast app. Be sure to follow Boobies and Newbies across social platforms at Boobies Podcast or at Real Kelly Ray on TikTok. If you're a fan of the podcast and you've got a few minutes to spare, I would greatly appreciate a five star review on Apple Podcasts. And lastly, if you want to be the first to know what we're reading next and have exclusive access to bonus clips, private chats, and so much more, you might consider hopping on over to our Patreon. Now, as per usual, I will be sure to include links for all of the above in today's show notes. And now, please join me in welcoming Amanda Elliott, author of the recently released Foodie Romance Best Served Hot. Welcome, Amanda. Thanks so much. And thanks so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Because let me tell you, if there is one thing I love more than romance novels, it's food. And so (laughs) to combine two of my favorite things into one interview, into one setting, uh, color me happy. (laughs) We have that in common. And hungry. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's talk about that. Because um, judging by the fact that your last two releases have been very foodie centric. And I will say I do my fair share of uh, research, aka spying, uh, when I prepare for these interviews. So I saw in your author bio that you collect way too many cookbooks. So I have to know, are you a foodie yourself? I am. Um, And I could spend this whole like highbrow thing about how I like writing about food because I like exploring like, you know, all the different cuisines and all the different like restaurants Mm. and all the different like kind of things that are associated with it but really I just like eating okay same I'm glad we're on the same page so because like you uh, well I'm not going to presume but like you I do have my fair share of cookbooks now take a wild guess how often I actually break them open and cook something out of one of the cookbooks (laughs) it's not a great percentage and I think it's just I'm with you I love to eat and I feel like Food always tastes better when somebody else makes it. I think there's like a scientific explanation for that because they say like when you're cooking it yourself, you get used to like the smells. And so it tastes like less intense when you actually eat it. I guess that makes sense in a weirdly scientific way. Sure. Like I've never thought about it like that before. And but it's true. I, I feel like every so often I will cook something that even surprises me and I'll be like oh my god this is so good like I did such an amazing job but I do think it's usually a new recipe where I'm not used to cooking it so I'm not used to those smells and ideas about like what it's supposed to look like so maybe that's why interesting I haven't thought about that but maybe that's why I like getting all these new cookbooks and trying all these new dishes okay so tell me what is one of your favorite things that you've made it, fairly recently, what's been a favorite recipe that you, you know, will try again? So I eat mostly vegetarian. So one of my favorite things to cook lately has just been kind of like Mediterranean smorgasbord because there are so many great vegetarian recipes in the various Mediterranean cuisines. So like, you yes. know, make like a big batch of hummus, put a batch of hummus on the plate. You know, hummus is so easy. You know, you dump in a can of chickpeas to your food processor with some lemon juice and tahini and salt and garlic. And, you know, you can add in whatever else you want, but At its core, that's what it is. And then there's this eggplant salad that I really like, which is kind of similar to hummus, Mm. but it's a roasted eggplant. And it's kind of not pureed the way the hummus is, but just kind of mashed until it's chopped. And I like some date syrup on top of that. I like a good like tomato, cucumber and onion salad with some lemon juice, like really bright and acidic. 
um, maybe with some bread or some couscous on the side mm. and top with something crunchy. Like I put on today, I put pistachios and fried onions on top and some olives on the side. And that was lunch. Ooh, okay. I like that. I like the idea of adding a little bit of something crunchy because I too love Mediterranean. In fact, one of the, the meals that I have on like my meal planning for the week is to do Mediterranean rice bowls. Um, but really you could do it with couscous, brown rice, quinoa, like anything. Right. And, uh, but I was thinking as I was putting together my shopping list, I feel like this is missing something crunchy. I need something crunchy. So I like the idea of adding, was it pistachios you said? Pistachios, yeah. I like that. I might have to try that. And I do love nuts. So, you know, throw it on top. Anytime you can add a little bit of crunch to something, I'm all for it. I am a like salty, sweet fiend, like Same. pretzel M&Ms, chocolate covered pretzels, popcorn and candy so anytime I can add a crunch into literally anything I'm gonna do it I feel like making like a good dish is similar almost to kind of making a good book because like when you're making a good dish you want to have like you know a variety of things in there you want maybe something a little sweet something a little salty something a little spicy um you know just like (laughs) ideally like your romance novel and wow we're gonna we're gonna really take off with this metaphor um (laughs) and if it depends how you incorporate them too and like the order in which you do them because, you know, we know that sometimes if you add things in too early, like the dough doesn't rise Ooh, or if one. you do it too quickly, um, it will fall flat. So, oh yeah, I really, we really went there with that <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, let's talk about, um, before we get into your latest release, Best Served Hot, which is available now, so everybody should go pick themselves up a copy and prepare to be hungry, bring snacks, be ready to read while hungry. Um, I did just want to kind of bring you back a little bit and ask you how you got started with your romance journey, both as a reader and writer. How did it all begin? Sure. So I've been a fan of romance novels for a while. Um, my favorite one, I think that was kind of my, almost my intro to the genre. Like I'd read them here and there over the years, but then I read, I want to say in 2018 or 2019, cause I, I think I had an advanced copy, but I read, um, Well Met by Jen DeLuca. Oh. And so I hadn't really thought of writing something like that myself. Cause I'd written mostly children's books up until then, mm-hmm. but I read that book and I put it down and I just remember sitting there thinking like, I want to write like that. Like, I want to write a book that makes someone feel like that book made me feel. And so that's what kind of sparked um, my romance journey. And from there, honestly, I'm a huge fan of Top Chef. Um, (gasps) The new season is about to come out. I am so pumped. Oh my Um, gosh. We can talk about, (laughs) we can have a whole podcast just talking about that because I'm with you. Top Chef is my go-to cooking show like I I don't watch a lot of reality tv where it's just people like sitting around being rich and hot um I do occasionally (laughs) but I love competition shows and Top Chef is my favorite same and so that's basically what inspired my first book my first romance Sadie on a Plate which was basically it started off as Top Chef fan fiction um (laughs) you know I was watching Top Chef and I was thinking like wow like that judge and that contestant, they seem to have some chemistry. Like, I wonder if, like, <laughs> I get, I know enough from, like, you know, reading behind the scenes stuff, listening to, like, behind the scenes podcasts that, yep. like, the judges and the contestants are totally forbidden to fraternize. But I was thinking, like, <laughs> well, but what if they did anyway? Oh, um, and who doesn't love a good forbidden romance? Like, when it's, exactly. you tell them what they can't do, I want them to do it more. Exactly. Like, that's basically, like, what motivates half my life. If someone tells yeah. me, don't do this, I'm like... <laughs> Well, now I didn't even want to do that before, but now I want to do that. Um, So, yeah, so that's where my first romance started. And then Best Served Hot came along second. Um, It's not a sequel. It's a standalone, though. It does feature a cameo from the first book, if you like Sadie on the Plate. Um, And this book is basically my love letter to the New York City restaurant scene. Um, Mm. So I wrote it while pretty much every restaurant in New York was closed um, because of COVID. So I was writing this book about eating out at restaurants and, you know, reviewing restaurants that was basically set like half in restaurants while all restaurants in real life were closed. Um, And so it made me really feel extra love for the industry and made me so happy to be able to go back. And yeah, so that's how those books came about. It's been really interesting. Speak. I, I feel like you're one of maybe two or three authors I've spoken to in 2023 so far 
where the project that is that they're currently promoting that is now out for people to read was something that began during the pandemic. And it's really fascinating kind of seeing the effects that the pandemic had on a lot of people and their writing. You know, I think it was uh, Alexis Daria who was telling me about her latest release, which is basically a Dancing with the Stars fan (laughs) fiction. And uh, and just sort of the fact that she was really excited to write about, uh, you know, just the idea of like being at live events, live TV shows. And then who else did I talk to? Oh, Amy Spaulding, uh, author of For Her Consideration. Uh, she was talking about that she was lusting after the idea of just being in a restaurant again and how her book is so mu- is full of food porn. And it's not even a foodie book. It's not even a book about food. She just said there's so many times where I sent the characters to restaurants and bars because when I was writing it, we couldn't do that. And so it was like writing porn because I wanted to have that satisfaction for my characters that I wasn't getting. So that's so interesting, though, that it's it kind of sounds like something similar where there was just so much motivation of like, we know the New York food scene is incredible. Um, You know, probably one of the most incredible places to get food in the world. But to especially think about it in terms of the pandemic and just wanting to get out there again and eat and try things. Oh, I, I love that these stories are are coming out and it's it's kind of a nice positive effect of a very traumatic event from the last couple of years for all of us. Yeah, I totally agree. Like writing this book, a lot of it was an escape, you know, of pretending yeah. that we were not in this, you know, kind of trapped in our apartment listening to all the sirens outside. And again, I know I was in a much um, better, more privileged position than a lot of people who are out there like working in the restaurant industry sure. who were losing their jobs and, you know seeing a very precarious livelihood kind of teeter. Um, But still it was very, you know, it was a stressful, depressing time. And so writing this book and like kind of being in this book where the pandemic didn't exist, um, it was really an escape. Yeah. Well, you kind of prefaced this already um, with, you know, just sort of what you've been talking about, the inspiration behind the book. But um, I'm going to ask you to do that thing that every author just loves to do since the sarcasm. And that is, would you mind giving a sort of brief synopsis for Best Served Hot? Of course. Although somehow summarizing a book in like a few sentences is somehow harder than writing the whole book, which is weird. I, I think most authors would agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so my shortest pitch for Best Served Hot is that it's my enemies to lovers restaurant reviewer rom-com. Um, so that's like my three phrase pitch. Um, and a slightly longer pitch is that um, <laughs> it follows two restaurant reviewers, one who reviews on social media and one who reviews for a traditional newspaper. Um, they have very different philosophies of reviewing and very different kinds of restaurants they review and audiences they review for. And what happens when a viral video of them yelling at each other at a food festival <laughs> forces them to start reviewing together. And so things get spicy, both emotionally and then later, spoiler, physically. Oh, yes. No, of course. Um, well, and I I absolutely loved this when I got the pitch for your book. I loved the description as one coveted restaurant reservation, a new twist on the one bed trope, which I think is hysterical. And I really do think you need to trademark copyright that phrase immediately. I love it. I didn't come up with that, but I love it. <laughs> Whoever did, um, bless their heart because it's just, I love that because (laughs) I'm a sucker for only one bed, but I love seeing it in all its different iterations and you've incorporated it into the one coveted restaurant reservation. (laughs) (laughs) And I know we've kind of been talking about food so much from the very beginning of our chat, but what is it specifically about food and romance for you that just is such like a great combination? Because I agree. I do think that I've read a lot of food centered romances in the last few years. And they always, to me, just feel like a a big hug. Yeah. So I think one, like, once again, I really love eating. And I think it's hard for (laughs) me to like write anything significant that doesn't involve food in some way, just because like, I'm always thinking about food. Like I'm the kind of person who like, who like makes lunch and then I'm immediately after that thinking like what am I gonna have for my afternoon snack I'm like what am I gonna make for dinner and like what can I bake this week you mean other people don't do that that's not like they don't finish their lunch and immediately start planning where they're gonna go for dinner (laughs) 
yeah, I don't understand people like that. <laughs> but um, but really, the other answer is that for me, food is like a form of romance. Mm-hmm. Like I think it's a way, at least for me, because I love to bake. I love to cook. Um, my husband is a great cook, but I'm still the primary cook in the household just because like, you know, for him, it's kind of a chore and something he ticks off the list. And for me, I just genuinely love, like, I love standing there and like chopping vegetables and like mixing things in a bowl. Like it's just something <laughs> I really enjoy doing. And so cooking for me, cooking for people is a way that I show love for them. And so I think that translates into my characters where feeding people and or cooking for people is like how they kind of show how they care. Mm. Um, And I also think there are so many great like um, romance descriptions that can also apply to food. Like the process of like eating and of like admiring some food, like engages all the senses and like there are some really sexy food descriptions yeah that's that's a good point in fact i i thinking about it i definitely have read food centered romances where i'm like wow i think we're the sexiest scenes or the descriptions about the cooking not even necessarily like them (laughs) getting down so i think that's a good point and honestly on the flip side how many times have you read a romance novel where the way that they've described somebody's lips or eyes or like the color of their nipples is somehow related back to food exactly and I feel like a lot of the same like descriptive words like are similar for using like for baking and for food like you know maybe not so much like mixing but like you know you're kind of like kneading something you dig your hands in and you're gonna you know you're playing with the silky dough like it's it all like it all kind of like it's the same or even like the words like adjectives to describe it like delicious scrumptious spicy like we use so many of these words interchangeably between food and sex relationships love dating like I I do find it's this really interesting like symbiotic relationship between the two totally wow here we are just doing our TED talk about food (laughs) sex and romance was there anything between uh, both Best Served Hot and your previous book, Sadie on a Plate, w- were there any recipes or, uh, you know, specific foodie moments that you included that stand out to you as like some of your favorites or maybe even something you learned? Um, so I'd say in Best Served Hot, all of the, the dishes that are that they eat at the restaurants are based on real restaurant meals that I've had. I love it. So I'd say I had so much fun. It actually, the, the acknowledgments of the book um, names all of those restaurants. So if you'd like, you could go on a Best Served Hot Food Tour. Um, that is freaking brilliant, by the way. I And you know what? I am going to hook you up friend like with my uh with Lauren who she lives in New York she is a reader blogger and she has this fantastic blog called literary dates and the entire idea is Ooh. that she takes herself on dates around New York and she's lived there for like over a decade at this point uh dates around New York inspired by locations from books she reads and I just I think it's such a fun idea and honestly I keep telling her I'm like you gotta organize some food tours you have to organize some not even just food but like walking tours and different sites to see and different bookstores to visit um so yeah I think the two of you together you could 100% put together a best served hot walking tour yeah that's so fun I think a lot of my favorite parts of um, Best Served Hot and writing those food scenes was getting to relive those meals and not just like, especially, you know, during the pandemic, but not just like delicious food, like, which was still fun because I'm that kind of person who takes pictures of everything I eat. So I had records to, you know, to look back on and describe that food, but also kind of revisit like what I was doing and who I was with when I ate those meals. Like I was like, oh, this is like the time I went out with my friend who was visiting and like we explored the Spanish market under Hudson Yards and we neither of us like particularly like grapefruit but we got this grapefruit granita anyway and it was like (laughs) one of the most amazing things that we'd ever eaten and just like sitting there and reliving things like that was so much fun um but I've also got to shout out the scene so Sadie on the Plate is all about cooking Best Served Todd is mostly about eating at restaurants and the main character is a terrible cook but I really love the scene where she kind of bravados herself into a cook-off because she's, you know, she doesn't want to admit to, um, you know, her enemy, Bennett, the other restaurant reviewer, that she has no idea what she's doing. 
And so she just finds herself like at his apartment trying to make a hamburger and like surreptitiously trying to consult her phone. Like, how do I do this? Like, <laughs> and like her followers are sending her like, um, cause she's a, a social media restaurant reviewer. And so her followers are sending her like tips and she's trying to like quickly like parse the tips while he's not looking. Um, and you know, the result of that, that cook off was not something I'd want to eat, but it was so much fun <laughs> to write. I like what you said about sort of like food evoking memories and like being able to like relive certain meals that you've had with with friends and and same for your characters. But I I do think that that is another reason why we do see food so often in romance novels is the idea of memories attached to food. I think a lot of times we tie it to family. Um, I mean, we've even seen this on episodes of Top Chef if they'll be asked to like recreate a meal that was super important to them or the meal that they think of when they first realized they wanted to be a chef. And I think that's another thing that food really does both in real life and in our books is just sort of bring back these memories. And like you're describing a scene from Best Served Hot, create new ones. Yeah, totally. Like I know um, just like one romantic food moment is that, um, for my husband and my first Valentine's day together, I was like, what should I make him? And I knew like, oh, well he likes beer. I'll make a chocolate beer cake. And Ooh, so like, I guess one. I, it, it ended up being delicious. I actually don't have, remember what recipe I used, but it was amazing. I wish I did remember it, but I had like, I scribbled like the ingredients down, um, for my shopping list on like, you know, a, like a scrap piece of paper or something when shopping. And then like, as what always happens with my like scraps of paper, it just kind of like disappeared somewhere in my apartment. And then like years later, like we're married and like we're moving and my husband has his like, you know, box of important things. And I'm like, oh, what's in here? And like, I open the box and like, there's my little scrap of paper with the ingredients <gasps> from his, um, his Valentine's Day cake. And I was like, oh my God. Oh, like, that's, that's amazing. I hope you have it framed or do something with it because, <laughs> or you know what you should do? I did this for a gift for my grandma a few years ago was we have the family banana bread recipe that's been passed down like by the generations, right? And I I could send it off the recipe or a photo of the recipe card to a vendor on Etsy who then put it onto like a hand towel. So like now it will always live on, on this, you know, little tea towel that she has with her in her little cottage. That's so cool. I feel like yeah, you can even it's... use it to like cook the banana bread, you know, as like, yes. you know, to move it, take it out of the oven and really go it's like full so, circle. It's so cool. Like I've seen people do the same thing, but they put the recipe on, um, it's like lasered onto like a, a cutting board. So, I mean, it's really clever, the way, the things that like people are coming up with to like preserve memories and traditions like amongst their friends and family, which I think is great. But I I love, I think putting it in a book is just as amazing to, you know, commemorate and memorialize these, these events and occasions. Yeah. I love all these, these ways to memorialize it because I think one of the, the cool things about, about food to me and how it relates to romance is that it is so like, you know, ephemeral, like, you know, you've got this cake and you know, I guess it doesn't really apply totally because we still have, you know, our wedding cake in the back of the freezer. You know, you pull it out <laughs> on the anniversary. So it's surprisingly good at our one year anniversary. Is it? Okay. But, um, I, that's been a question that's always been on my mind is, does it, is it actually good? <laughs> <laughs> Probably depends on the cake. But I feel like for, you know, for most foods, like, you know, you eat your piece of cake, it's delicious, and then it's gone. And like, you know, you might remember like, wow, that was an amazing cake. You might remember what it tastes like, but you're not going to like carry the memory of that that taste around with you. And I think it's the same with like romance. Like you have like your wonderful first kiss and it's like so wonderful and romantic, but like you don't care, you know, you have it and you remember it, but it's not mm-hmm. something that that is with you forever the way like, you know, your tea towel or like a book can be. Yeah. Um, and so I think part of the beauty in both of those things is that they are ephemeral and that um, you know, you have to savor them while you've got them. Yeah, absolutely. Books last forever, baby. So that's not <laughs> going anywhere. Well, okay, now that you've written two back to back foodie centric romances, I guess the real question is, what's next? Is it more food? I think anything I write will have food in it. Um, and so <laughs> whether I can't you intend to or not. <laughs> exactly. Like it's, it's getting in there, whether it's food centric or not. Um, So I can't talk publicly about what's up next, but I can assure you that there will be lots of food in it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and I like that you're also kind of traversing different foodie cities, which, by the way, have all been on Top Chef as well. 
um, in your books because I think uh, Sadie on the Sadie on a Plate was it was Seattle, wasn't it? And then well, it started in Seattle, but then she ended up in New York. In New York, and uh, I'm and biased. Best served hot takes place in New York. I mean, it's what you know, right? And and it's a fantastic food scene like we know this so like why not write about New York but I I would love to see you write about more foodie places too (laughs) if you need recommendations for Portland San Francisco or Los Angeles or Chicago let me know to all places I've never been so I will hit you up (laughs) I'm happy to consult with anybody who needs to verify facts about these cities (laughs) (laughs) Oh, gosh. Well, I look forward to whatever comes next. Uh, Best Served Hot is available now. So like I said, I hope people pick up a copy. I'm sure just by listening to this podcast, people will be reaching for the nearest snack. So all the more reason to stock up and download the book or pick up a copy today and read it. Um, And then I know you can't talk about your next project, but the thing I always want to know from authors is, is there a dream project Is there just something that sort of lurks around your brain waiting to be told someday? Oh my goodness. That's a good question. I don't know if I've been asked that before. There are definitely some IPs I would kill to write for, like some intellectual properties, like, you know, for shows or, or various properties. Like, you know, I grew up an American girl and Barbie would love to write something (gasps) for like American girl or Barbie. Maybe like Barbie is a chef, you know, American girl cook, cooking American girl. I love that. I think that's fun. And honestly, if that doesn't happen, I think you should write the fan fiction and turn it into a book. I could. Just call her Darby. (laughs) (laughs) Problem solved. (laughs) Well, those would be great, though. I, oh, God, you're taking me back to the 90s. Like, and honestly, I've been seeing a lot of people on TikTok going to um, the American Girl doll store. I think there's a giant one in New York. And there's that Barbie movie coming out. So 90s nostalgia is coming in full force in 2023. Awesome. Yeah. Did you see that the new, newest historical American girl was like 10 in 1999? So that really hit me hard in the 90s nostalgia. Oh my God. I've never felt older. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic though. I, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to have nightmares about that, but thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. <laughs> I think the last thing would just be to let everybody know where they can find and follow you to keep up with what's coming up next and what I would assume would be some yummy recipes as well. Like, I hope you're sharing all of your food knowledge with the internet. I share a lot of food in my Instagram stories. So if you want to see food, um, definitely follow me on Instagram. There I'm at Amanda Panich. Um, That's P-A-N-I-T-C-H. Um, and you can also sign up for my newsletter on my website. My website's amandapanich.com. Um, same spelling. And I promise I'm not an annoying newsletter person. Um, I send it out every month or two, um, but it's where I'll be sharing, um, you know, whatever comes next. And I also like to share kind of what I'm cooking at the time too. Love it. And then just to clarify for people, um, Amanda does write under Amanda, Amanda Panich for, um, I know you have some YA books as well as children's books. So yes. And so I write under Amanda Panich also, and I was too lazy to change my, um, <laughs> social media and website when I started writing as Amanda Elliott, but we are the same person. You do you. And honestly, there you go. You got books for the whole family, every, every reading level. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much. Um, you have me, you know, appropriately hungry. So following this, I will be making a snack, um, as it should be. Awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you so much. so much for listening. Tune in every Friday for a brand new episode of Boobies and Newbies. And don't forget, you can always catch up on previous episodes on your favorite podcast app or on boobiesandnewbies.com. Happy reading!